conversations on um, contemporary uh, relevant topics, things that people are thinking about. And so we're very, very pleased uh, that we've got uh, an outstanding uh, set of folks to talk about uh, speaking our truth in the age of Trump. Just a moment before we get going uh, to talk a little bit about what we've been working on at Common Cause New York. A lot of what we're focused on right now is trying to help people understand how important it is to register and get out to vote. And, and I have a feeling that everybody in this room knows that tomorrow is federal congressional election day in New York State. But not everybody has a primary. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to check and see whether you have a congressional primary tomorrow, uh, you can look it up on the New York State Board of Elections website. And a lot of work that we've been doing is actually directed towards not only registering, but actually mobilizing millennial voters. We found actually the text messaging occasional voters can really make a difference. It can really move the needle. It can keep uh, the uh, rate of turnout from the presidential uh, to a, a mid-level midterm election from dropping, and it can actually increase the level of millennials who turn out from the presidential to a midterm or a municipal election if they actually engage in a dialogue back and forth with us uh, through text messaging. And that's our Generation Vote Project. And just this afternoon, uh, we've been in contact with the organizers of the uh, uh, march. Uh, families belong together this coming Saturday and we are have volunteered to recruit and put people out all along the bridge with clipboards to help people register um, and because one of the things that's making us a bit crazy is how many marches and rallies we're seeing where people aren't being reminded about the importance of voting and how many people actually aren't registered or have moved and need an opportunity to register. So on the way out, if you are interested in helping register what we think is likely to be a pretty large crowd on Saturday morning, starting at uh, Foley Square and marching across the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, addressing this uh, really tragic situation at the border, then uh, please sign up with folks who are going to have clipboards on the way out. Um, and that's really just a portion of what we do. But right now, I think it's the most urgent. Yes? terrific about Common Cause that I discovered today with regard to voting tomorrow. And I got a tickle in an email that I think might have been from you. And at the Common Cause website itself, you're able to determine whether or not your district has a primary tomorrow. So instead of going to the New York State Board, you guys made it really, really easy to go through Common Cause. It was outstanding, and I highly encourage it and encourage all your friends. Thank you for that shout out. <laughs> I can't ask for a more positive way to begin, um, but I think we should get going. Um, and I hope to see some of you with us on Saturday morning. It'll be an early morning, but I think an important one. So we're going to have a conversation about speaking our truth in the age of Trump. And I am delighted uh, that we have Prachi Gupta, who is a senior reporter with Jezebel.com, who's going to help us kick off and lead the discussion. But I think she has a viewpoint of her own uh, to add to the conversation as well. Uh, and we are uh, pleased that DeRay McKesson uh, took time off from helping elect the right people down in Baltimore uh, to join us this evening. And he's the host of Pod Save the People, one of my very favorite podcasts. And I think in New York City, Melissa Mark Viverito needs little introduction. Uh, she is the former speaker of our city council, and she is currently with the Latino Victory Project, um, helping to mobilize Latino voters uh, and to elect uh, good people to office. So I'd like to have them come up, and let's get the conversation started. Thank you all. Does anybody know? <laughs> we have a request. If uh, Jennifer and Jessica is here, the password for the Wi Fi, do we know what it is? Yes. Yes, it is. Thank 
Thank you. So for anybody else, that was Cobalt Blue, mm -hmm. capital C, capital B for blue, 1871 so for the Wi-Fi. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Boom. All right. This is a mic. Wow. Thank you guys for coming. Um, so we are speaking about truth under the age of Trump. Uh, I'm just going to get right into it. I want to talk about Sarah Sanders. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to talk about Sarah Sanders, but we're going to talk about Sarah Sanders. Um, so I'm sure that everyone has heard about Sarah Sanders getting kicked out of that Virginia restaurant. Yes. Uh, Representative Maxine Waters is like, yeah, keep doing it. But then the Washington Post is like, no, we must be civil. Nancy Pelosi is also in that boat. Um, I didn't see Nancy Pelosi. What did she say? Yeah, she uh, she tweeted basically just like, no, this is a time that we must be civil. And I think there was like a... I'm tired of that. Yeah. <laughs> the word civil. No. Uh, somebody else tweeted like a, a joke about like the Civil War just being like, oh yeah, that's how we refer to that war. It's like the Civil War. So that word is has a new meaning to me now. Um, and also Donald Trump threatened Maxine Waters today. I saw that. Yeah. So I know he that threatened Senator Warren yesterday, and he threatened this one the other day, and yeah. So the way I want to start off this conversation is, I would just like to hear your thoughts about in this whole civility debate, um, and what responsibility you think we have to speak up in spaces where we're not really expected to be having political viewpoints or expressing political viewpoints like what we saw to, with Sarah Sanders. Um, these are not normal times. These are not civil times. And I think when you're talking about communities of color in particular, that we are uh, dead into the bullseye of this administration. Uh, this individual that occupies the White House, which every day is attacking people, is demeaning people, is dehumanizing people, is criminalizing people. You know, language is is powerful, and we have to find our way of resisting. And it's fascinating to me that in these this discourse of being civil, uh, how stark it is about who's asking for civility. It's not the communities, right? They're not representative of the communities that are under attack, an incessant attack, where we feel literally our lives are on the line. And so this idea of finding the way to resist, right? Whether you're a restaurant owner and you have the ability to say, you know what, we don't uphold these values and we don't want you to sit here uh, and be here and uh, people feeling, the people that work there feeling in some way threatened. This is the time to do it. Our bodies have to be on the line for the families that are being separated, for the Puerto Rican families that are forcibly displaced, where we've gotten an equitable treatment and continue to receive an equitable treatment. I'm, I'm tired of hearing about being civil. These are not normal times. This is a time in our history which it is really threatening our democracy. Uh, and we have to stand back, you know, resist and push back. So uh, I'm all about resistance and I'm all about pushing back and I am not about being civil right now. I'm cursing a lot in my Twitter these days, more so than usual, but it is what it is. I worry about, you know, when people say when they go low, we go high. It's like, I think we might take the high road to oblivion pretty mm -hmm. soon on the left. <laughs> And that, like, if we go high, we still got to win, you know? And I feel like on the left, it's like people just go high and sort of sit there and stop fighting. And, like, high doesn't mean that you stop fighting. High doesn't exactly. mean the absence of confrontation. When I think about civil, I'm reminded that, like, the work that we do is rooted in civil disobedience, right? And, like, that was what Maxine was talking about. That, like, there's a way to confront. There's a way to disrupt that is also not, like, violent. But it is, like, real disruption. And that is civil, too. And I think what the right is just doing really well is that they sort of play the moral, they sort of put these markers in the ground that are moral markers that don't apply to them at all, but apply to everybody else. And like, we keep falling for it. It's like, it's fascinating. They get to do, like she wears a, how do you wear a jacket that says, I don't care. <laughs> and that's like totally fine. And like her team's like, yep, she wore it. Like that's what she, and Maxine says this thing, you would think she just called for war in like, the Middle East, and you're like, that is so wild, and they just do that really well. They do that well of like putting these moral markers and creating these standards that apply to everybody else but them. And I think that we see that time and time again with Trump, and it is weird to watch the left keep falling for it. It's like in the middle of like kids in cages, they're like still falling for it. And you're like, guys, like they're winning, they're winning the game here. 
Yeah. And then creating division amongst ourselves, right? The left. I mean, it's like they're dividing, having us divide our, amongst ourselves. It's like, wait, why don't we just create a united front? And this idea, again, of, of who is under attack and who is responding. I mean, again, the discourse is very stark when you hear about who's saying be civil. It's, it's not the individuals representing communities that are literally having their children ripped away. I mean, when you hear about a mother nursing her child and the child is being taken away from them, I mean, I've, I've, I'm a pretty stoic person and I've broken down several times in the last week when I've talked about these issues because I just don't understand what we're becoming. And we have to find a way um, to express it and voice it and within the power that we have. And every, everybody's sense of power, what they have control over is different, right? If you're a business owner, you have a sense of being able to make a decision. If you are part of a nonprofit organization or an organization that is providing legal services, so it's, you have to find the way that you can um, contribute to this cause uh, because it is it's such a, a difficult time right now. So it's a very desperate time right now for many of us. And it makes me think too of like what it means that the people that manage and control the biggest media outlets aren't impacted by most mm -hmm. of the stuff that Trump's doing. So it's how the Washington Post editorial board can just be like, yeah, like be civil. You're like, yeah, because they're not deporting any of your friends. Or, like right. you're not impacted by that. You're not impacted by the criminal justice stuff. Like it's how we can see the Trump administration people continue to be on CNN every two days. It's like this is sort of like an interesting political moment for them as opposed to like a moment that has real consequences for people. And that was what, you know, I, the New York Times editorial people, I sort of, you're just like, okay, you just never know where you're going to get. The Washington Post, I was like, the Washington Post is just going to like hold us down. And then you saw that, I bet you're like, or the like editorial board that you're like, what happened, you know? Or even, and I love Arnie Duncan. I like respect Arnie. I love Arnie. Arnie's a friend. And that tweet, I was just like, what happened? You're like, Arnie did the civility that Arnie oh, did like a you know this isn't what we should do and you're like Arnie this is like not wrong message right like sit this one out and I think there were people who like again it's like what happens when you're not it's not going to affect you directly this is an intellectual experience for you not a lived experience but also the whole Michelle Wolf also right in terms of when she was when she was doing the correspondence dinner the attacks that she got and people saying oh she should have I mean it's 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 seems to be women, but I was talking to Prachi before in terms of, of also who do we see actually pushing back in the media, right? Like we have actually is people of color, you have, and then you have people like, um, you know, Joy Ann Reed, obviously, uh, on CNN, you have that. I, I don't know him because I don't follow him, but he's a gentleman that was pushing back on this Trump uh, supporter who was trying to present these alternate facts about what Jay Johnson said. Mm. And he said, no, wait a minute, hold on. I interviewed Jay Johnson. That is not what he said. And we're going to replay that right here, right now. And he challenged her right on the spot. And, you know, that kind of stuff. And these, it's people, again, that represent communities that are severely impacted, that are pushing back. Rachel Maddow, she's openly lesbian, right? So she's obviously the, the impact that the policies of this administration and the impact that it has for her uh, and for her partner and for others that, that she represents, you know, th those are the people that are really saying no, right, in terms of, of being in the media and about questioning and about challenging the lies and, and what is being presented. And, and somehow others see a problem with that. And it's, it's, it's really been very, it's very difficult. I mean, I'm very involved in the struggle with the immigrant families, and I'm also very obviously involved with the Puerto Rico situation. Um, and on all those fronts, it's emotionally exhausting and draining what we're going through, and we're being attacked on all fronts as Latinos and people of color in this country. And so we're gonna, we're gonna resist in the way that we can. And Joe Scarborough even said that the Trump supporters are racist. You're like, look yeah. at that, Joe. It took you a long time. <laughs> like, you gotta put you kids in cages for you to be like, wow, this is bad. <laughs> like, okay. It's like the Trump administration, they're calling for the death penalty for drug dealers. That is like a real thing. And it's like, that's sort of a problem too. You know, but like, whatever gets you there, Joe, like whatever got you there. That's like one step short of Duterte, right? Like he's right. just openly killing him on the streets. Well, yeah, let's just get the death penalty and let's make, I mean, this guy keeps pushing the bar. I mean, it's crazy and the Republicans are just standing by and not doing anything. And we're really, really on a precipice here where it's very dire right now. It's really serious. Yeah, I mean, like from my own experience, just talking about what, what you're saying, like um, a few years ago in the campaign, I had an opportunity to interview Ivanka Trump. Um, and this was, you know, she didn't do a whole lot of press at the time, but she uh, was floating the child care and family leave policy for the uh, Trump administration. And 
she only did a couple, she did an, an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, and she did one interview, I think, on ABC, and then I was the next interview um, that she did, and nobody asked her about the serious policy questions or the holes. And I think I was also the only person of color who talked to her, and it was just like, at that, that moment, I was like, I have to push back. And then in the interview, she actually called me negative. So it was exactly this, what we're talking about, this like, sorry, I was literally just doing my job, but that was being negative. So holding somebody accountable is, is now in this administration seeing somebody as negative or a, you know, extremist in a way. Um, so it's really interesting how we're using, like, how language is being used when we're just participating in a conversation and language is wielded sort of against, against us when we're, when we're trying to have those discussions and push back a little bit. Yeah, even think I'm fascinated. You know, I spend most of my time around issues of policing, and it is fascinating to watch Trump dismantle the FBI and like still talk about how great law enforcement is. I think that is like the <laughs> best like sleight of hand. You're like, how is you literally are, like firing the FBI people, like the director, <laughs> deputy director? You're like saying you have no faith in them. And if I said that, if I'm like, I don't have faith in law enforcement, people would be like, DeRay like, doesn't believe in America, he's not a patriot. You are literally like dismantling, that is wild to me. And, but it is this great example of the, like, the devil speak and how they create these standards that don't apply to them, but apply to everybody else. Uh, and I continue to be fascinated by the dismantling of the FBI, that like, who thought that the Trump administration would be the people that took the FBI down? Like, yeah. That was never what I would have thought. I don't really want to give them credit as being these like, masterminds, because I don't think that they are. But there is, I mean, they're incredible at just warping the truth. And then it's, it's so, or I know that the term Orwellian gets thrown out a lot, but it really just seems like that. Like, when you put words to like what the, like the way they just use words and like they don't mean anything and suddenly they gave it a new meaning um like for example just what we were talking about earlier which is um donald trump introduced a policy of separating families at the border that was not a policy before it didn't exist then he blamed congressional democrats for it and then other people in his administration were like oh no that's not even a policy meanwhile they're pushing everything farther to the right and Trump swoops in with this executive order two days later after, you know, did not, they essentially did, his administration denies the policy exists to correct it, but his order doesn't correct it. It actually makes his extremist views like real now policy. Po real policy. <laughs> and right. then the media, a lot of the media is reporting it as if, oh, he reversed course. And, he that's, <laughs> and that's the thing about whole, I mean, it's, it, I mean, I don't want to put everything in blanket the media, but sometimes in terms of how the ma some of this mainstream media is covering it, they are complicit. Yeah. Because how yeah. can, you know, I was being interviewed by the NPR after the day after, and I was like, I don't give this guy credit for one thing, one minute. And like, and how, did, how can you say that? He created this mess. He, it, it's a false narrative that he's created, and now he's going to try to blame the Democrats, and now because he decided to take this one step, and that wasn't even a real executive order. There's no legal standing with that executive order, right? He's made this situation worse, where now you have actually the, the Congress debating the idea and presenting a law, potentially, a, a bill, to increase the amount of days that you can keep kids in detention with their families. I mean, it's... It's ridiculous. So, so this idea of, of like how do we push back and whole, the media needs to be calling out these lies day after day and they're becoming somewhat complicit. And it really startles me quite a bit. So the, you know, that's why I believe and I, I said that the only check we seem to have right now is the galvanizing and going into the streets. The constant mobilizations that are shedding light and not you know, being unafraid to expose what is happening, right? And calling people out when you have, I mean, the gall, it's either A, intentionally provocative, or it's just such living in a bubble that it's, it's an extreme. When you have Secretary Nielsen and you have Miller going to Mexican restaurants in Washington, D.C., when the policies that you are promoting and upholding are literally ripping Mexican babies from their mother's arms and from their father's arms, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, so the idea that they would get booed out of the restaurants, that's incredibly important, right? The fact that we're going to LaGuardia Airport to say that we're here to welcome these children, that we're showing up with candlelight vigils, that we're exposing and shedding light, that's kind of, to me, the only check we have right now is like to continue to expose the inhumanity that is there and the abnormalcy 
of this administration. And, and we gotta keep doing it. So even though, you know, this false sense of security of this executive order, we gotta keep going out onto the streets every single day. It's, um, it's, it's hard, it's very hard to hear some of the coverage that is happening. I would say three quick things. One is, I think this moment is a reminder that the best idea doesn't always win. And I think that the left is often seduced by this notion that the best idea wins. I think that what the right has figured out is that the idea that is beaten to people's head over and over is actually the idea that wins. That is like the, that is actually the power of Donald Trump is that he gets that the best idea is not the winner. I think that this this moment is a really great example. Is that like he's like no policy, and you're like no, that really is a policy. There's like no policy, so people are like actually debating that as like a legitimate exactly. stance. So you're like no, that is not real, but you said it a million times. Everybody's saying it. You created this confusion, and like I think that that is interesting. I what I worry about is is that there's some people who believe that the history of injustice in this country began with the Muslim ban, right? They're like, wow. And you're like, no, no, the country's bad. This is, <laughs> this is just it's like, hard, yeah. this is like now more people are captured in the bad, so it's just like a little easier to participate in the moment because everybody's, you just never know when you're next, right? Like it might be you, might be you, might be you, no healthcare for anybody. Like that is just, the threat is just getting wider, but the country's been hard for a lot of people for yeah. a long time. And there's a question of like I think about when we were in the street in St. Louis, in Ferguson, it was not cool to protest. Like protests were like these crazy things that only these crazy people did. Now it's like if you don't if you don't go to a protest today, you're like not a good citizen, right? That's like a that is sort of a new thing. Or like if you aren't at the airport, if you didn't at least try to go to the border, right? Like no money to buy a plane ticket, but if you didn't like tell somebody you wanted to be at the border, then like how dare you be an American? And the question is like when the threat is not as over and when the threat is not as wild as Donald Trump and the threat isn't as sort of wild as Melania's jacket or like whatever, will people still be as mobilized? And like, I don't know. Mm. Uh, like I'm, I'm interested in like what that moment looks like and how we get, how we like build the energy right. to sustain that. And I think the other issue is that, you know, we have to, we have to build the bridges amongst the struggles, right? And. You know, the issue of Puerto Rico, we've gotten a lot of solidarity and a lot of support, but we cannot isolate that, right, from the struggle with the separation of families, and we cannot isolate that from the issue of the Muslim ban. I mean, this is an overall and full-scale frontal attack on communities of color. And that's what this administration is about, is it really appealing to that nativist, white supremacist base. Um, and every policy and every action that they take is just geared in that direction. It's incessant, right, to the point where it's exhausting. And like, where do you start? But we have to figure out how do we make this an overarching, you know, movement that embraces all of that and captures all of that and that we have to be um, supporting everybody. And I think that that's the concern also is these silos, right? Okay, now it's about the separation of families right now. Uh, but before it was about police brutality and attacks and the kneeling, right? And then the issue of Puerto Rico. I mean, they're all related in some way. And we, we got to make that, um, that make, make that real to all of us so that we know that this is a full-scale attack on all of us and that we've got to be in this together and that that's the way that we're able to sustain a movement. Um, and, and that's the only concern I have, right, is right now we, for instance, those of us, you know, I, I went to the border. <laughs> we organized a rally with um, Congressman O'Rourke in Tornillo on Father's Day, and Latino Victory did. Um, but I'm also extremely involved as a Puerto Rican, as a Boricua, I'm very involved, obviously, with the issue of Puerto Rico. And we have about, you know, 2,000 plus people that on June 30th are literally going to be kicked out of the temporary housing that they have here in the United uh, States side, right? Uh, between Florida, New York, and, and Massachusetts and some other states. And, you know, our concern today as we were grappling with that was like, okay, there's this major mobilization happening on the 30th about the separation of families, uh, but we're also fighting this issue of Puerto Rico and, and FEMA and federal response. And like, you know, we didn't want to compete. How do we make sure we still have attention on this issue? It's 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 a very difficult situation to find yourself in as an activist and and someone who believes in social justice overall. But we have to figure out how to bring those all those struggles together and and make it an overarching kind of theme or or fight. You know, it's hard. And I, what I think is sort of hard dist about the left is that. You know, when you think about Make America Great Again, that's about like recalling memory. Is that they're just recalling all that? Like the 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 dog whistles have become barks. 
but it's a sound that we're still familiar with, that like we know what this is like. We, the separation of families isn't new. There's like a long racist history of that, right? Like this is all recalling stuff mm -hmm, in the past. Mm -hmm. I think that what is hard about the left is that when we think about a world of equity, justice, and joy, that's new, like we don't know, we've never lived that. That is like all sort of imaginary. So when you even think about things like everybody should get healthcare, they're like, 10 versions of what that could look like. That's not like just sort of a one thing. When we think about a world where the police don't kill people, but safety looks different, that's not like one feature, that could be a million features. I think that some of the reasons why the coalition stuff is hard is that we don't, we sort of agree on like the freedom part. We don't agree on the like what it looks like in practice and that is sort of where the tension comes. Yeah. And that is like because our work is really about making something that nobody's ever seen and their work is about bringing back stuff that we saw and thought we got rid of. And those are just two very different sort of challenges, right? Two very different pathways of work. So when you see him propose to combine the labor department and the department of education as a real idea, you're like, that is a legitimate proposal. You're like, okay, I guess, I guess we did have a country where like nobody cared about kids. Like that was a real thing, right? That's like why the Department of Education came up and that's why like child labor laws, right, right, right. you know, like labor movements came up. But th you're right, there was a time before any of these structures to like stop people exploiting children existed and you're trying to take us back and like we know what that looks like, right? In this world where like everybody gets access and we think about the difference between equality and equity, that equality is everybody gets the same thing. Equity is that people get what they need and deserve. And we think about a world of equity, it's like we just don't, we've never lived that. Mm -hmm. This is all a dream. It is all an imaginary thing for us right now. And I think that that is where like some of the coalition work actually breaks down is that we fight about what that looks like in practice. Yeah, I, I wonder- Equity has never really existed, right? Because even those who are in power that's not equitable, right? What they have, what they've been able to capture, it's because they're oppressing others. And through oppression, they have more than is their fair share. Yeah, that's the point. So right, like, so like, nobody's ever lived. Yeah, it's all imaginary. We're like trying to figure it out. Right, right. right. Um, and, and uh, you know, sorry, but you were gonna. No, I just, I wanted to hear more about your, both of your experiences dealing with that in, in politics and political organizing, um, because you have to bridge that gap. You have to find ways to sort of bring people in together from a lot of diverse backgrounds into some sort of a mission. And I think as we're heading into the midterms, something that's been really frustrating in the elections and um, for me personally to see the Democratic Party, like I've been waiting for them to have a message that's more than just, we are not Donald Trump. Um, and I think a lot of us have, and it's, it's, I think it's, it's a lot of it is what you're saying, that there, there's no cohesive like plan on what exactly we want that future to look like. So I just wanted to hear a little bit about your personal experiences of an organizing um, around that and how you've sort of tackled that issue. You know, I think that it's, I spend a lot of time around the police and mass incarceration, and what's interesting is that people don't really believe the police kill somebody until they kill somebody in their neighborhood, and they're like, oh my God, the police kill people. We're like, told you, right? Like, <laughs> yes, they kill people. Like, this is like a, you know, a third of all the people killed in this country by strangers killed by a police officer. In places like California, one in 11 homicides in the state of California is committed by an officer, right? Like, this is like a, it's been a real thing. It is a real thing. I got a call from a reporter today being like, do you have a quote about the recent killing? It's like, I don't know like the police are killing people. That That is like the story, right? Like that is the story, it is bad, it's not and right. Suddenly you realize this. But it's like, but people don't really believe it until it happens like really close to them. I think that that is what Trump has shown us is that like white people weren't ready to go into anybody's street until the healthcare thing, people are like, oh no. And you're like, they've been doing this to poor people and people of color for a long time, right? But like the healthcare thing would have impacted so many people that wasn't, it wasn't just people of color. It was like people all across the food stamp thing that they're trying to propose. The work requirements like are impacting like poor white people in ways that we've never seen like major policy just like back to back hit poor white people. And like I think that that sort of is an interesting thing. I, like I said, the organizing part that makes you nervous is like when the threat isn't so over because some of this stuff mm -hmm. could happen really quietly, but he's just so loud about everything that like you know he's gonna take your health care, right? It's not gonna be like in the middle of the night, he's gonna say it very loudly and then take a photo of it, you know? Or like the tax bill, it's like they rewrote the tax code on the back of a napkin and you're like, okay. So when people tell me that like this stuff takes a generation, it's like they literally wrote the tax, rewrote it on scrap paper. Like the biggest overall the tax code in the history of the country on scrap crap paper, like we could end all the other stuff very quickly, you know? And I think that one of the hard things is helping people believe that this is possible in our lifetime, that like, I think one of the dangers of the left is that people have accepted that this will be just like a generational thing that we fight for forever. And it's like Trump gave 
$700 billion to the military. It would take less than $200 billion to take every single person out of poverty. It's never a matter of resources. It's always a matter of will. And what you find mm -hmm. is that some people just like don't, they just don't know, right? So like, they don't know that they could ask for more. They don't, they just don't know. And like if they could rewrite the tax code in the back of napkins and paper towels, like we could actually end mass incarceration in two strokes, right? Like we could do this stuff rather quickly if people understood the way that power works and doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that completely. Um, you know, as as you know, as as a Puerto Rican who um, is very aware of of the political reality that I live, you know, we um, continue to be a colony of the United States, and as a colony, you're an oppressed people, and not being able to kind of fulfill right the full potential that you have as individuals and as potentially as a country. And so that idea has really, really shaped, you know, my worldview, has really shaped the view of the work that I do, um, and that global sense of, of justice that I believe in as, a, as, as an oppressed person, right? And understanding that as Puerto Rican born and raised, where my mother continues to live on the island, where my, 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 my identity and my culture is very much tied to that, um, you know, I understand that struggle to some extent, right? There's a, an affinity and an empathy and an understanding of oppression when you're coming from that perspective and knowing that that dynamic and that reality has led to some really grave injustices. And if you really study the history of Puerto Rico and you really study how we've been experimented on and how we have basically served in military forces and we've served disproportionately and given blood to this country and other things that, that have happened, you know, it really does, um, if you open yourself up to that, really helps shape the work and the involvement that I, I have been involved in with, with, with justice overall. So the issue of, of uniting and building bridges and, and building a sense of, of commonality in those struggles is, I think, critical if we're going to succeed in overcoming injustice, is that we have to be able to see ourselves in the undocumented immigrant. We have to be able to see ourselves in the struggle of the African-American community that disproportionately, although Latinos obviously, but more disproportionately African-Americans in mass incarceration uh, and the issues that, that that brings out. So that was what shaped the work that I did as a speaker, right? I was involved in all of those issues because I believed in a sense of justice overall. So that to me is, is where I think the challenge is, is right now in this moment, I think we, you spoke to it, we've been speaking about it, is, is to really make sure that we all understand that we're all in it together and there's more common threads in all of the fights that we're involved in, you know, than the things that separate us. And this is a time to really um, come together. And I've just, I have a sense of urgency right now that I have not had in all of the time. I'm almost, you know, 50 years old. And I've been organizing since I've come to, to, the, to New York City at the age of 18. Uh, and it's really very different time right now, as many of you can attest to as well. So um, I'm, I, I, you know, I, it has to be incessant, the level of engagement and activism. We have to be able to, to hear each other and listen to each other. But we're all being oppressed in one way or another. And this administration is really doing that unfortunately masterfully not maybe intentionally but it, they are winning <laughs> so we have to acknowledge that and and figure out how do we then um, bring the counter attack and that's kind of like where my mindset is right now uh, one other aspect I think of telling our truth um, as people of color is that we oftentimes have to just call out racism um, and especially with this administration. Um, but as you pointed out, it's not just with this administration. That's been forever. Um, but like, for example, um, in the past couple of years, I've noticed that when you call something out as, or somebody or something out as racist, that is seen by the media and, and by the general public maybe as more offensive than the actual thing that's racist a lot of times. I, I get pushback. So this happens in, in I'm not even talking about like the Fox News people right now. I'm just talking about like even in sort of progressive or liberal circles. So, um, for example, with when Donald Trump uh, made his shithole countries comment, um, there were so many outlets declaring this as the moment that Donald Trump is racist. Like this is the arbitrary line in the sand we're going to draw. Um, so, how do you like? How do you feel about that? How have you dealt with that? Like, 
when you like calling somebody or something racist and identifying it for what it is, is there power in that? Or is that, I guess, I don't know, I'm just sort of rambling now, but I'm sure that you've experienced this as well. I already spoke to you. White people are the only people debating over this. <laughs> <laughs> People of color are not like, there's no debate. You're, you're like, that was racist. You know, the question of like, how you bring it up to people, some people like the Trumps, it's like you just say like, the hard part is that for some people you wanna like bring them into a conversation so we can like unpack why you said that and like help you. And then some people aren't interested in that. Insert Sarah Sanders, right? So the people that aren't interested in it, it's like, well, you just gotta say like, just so you know that was racist. And like, just so everybody else knows that that was like problematic and racist. And I think it is sort of as simple as that. I, that's why I think Morning Joe sort of stuck out to me that he was like, oh my God, the Trump supporters are racist. It's just like, I'm more fascinated by like how heinous something actually has to be and how explicit it has to be for it finally to be racist. That like calling for the death penalty for drug dealers, not good enough. Shit, whole country is not good enough. Like any of the derogatory things you've said, like none of that was like actually reached your bar of what like intentional practices meant to like harm people of color like that none of that it didn't reach your bar but this one thing finally was bad enough i think that's what i'm more fascinated by but like people of color aren't having this debate like i don't think people of color use the word willy-nilly i think people say it because you're like that was racist like that was <laughs> yeah and we encounter racism so much that we're not like shocked anymore by it you're like that was racist like so you're sort of saying it's like a statement of fact you're like that was racist so i think that again it's just like another sleight of hand by the administration to like shift the conversation. Like, I think Melania's jacket was a great example, too, of the conversation stopping about kids in cages and was about fashion for 24 hours. And it's like, they are that intentional. Like, I don't think anything that comes out of this administration is like some random mistake. I think it's a part of a plan and they feign dumbness. Like that story about Trump uh, having typos in the tweet so he seems more common. You're like, this is a game to you guys. Like, you're playing a master game and we are the pieces. No, I, I think I mean, that's 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 a good point, and you know, I I say it pretty openly whenever I'm interviewed, and when you talk about the response to uh, Puerto Rico after the hurricane, when you compare it to the response to Texas or Florida after the hurricanes, it's very clear these are racist policies, you know, meant to treat certain people as less than, and to some extent, like I'm not. I think at the beginning there was more pushback. I, I somehow feel, and we can't be made to feel defensive about it, right? That's the other thing is like, yeah. no, we have to assert it, say it, own it. It's real because we're living that reality. Our communities are living that reality. And so nobody can take that away from us, right? And anybody that tries to make us kind of feel guilty or to hold back or push back in utilizing that terminology um, is basically de trying to deny us our truth. And we can't allow that, right? So the the issue of of, of being able to um, to call it out for what it is is critically important. And I'm also finding, like, I was interviewed by Brian Lehrer last week after the the, the separation of families, and I you know I, I mentioned racism and I said these nativist based that is what he's, and this guy was tweeting at me that from the Upper East Side because we do have these you know we do have these little footholds of <laughs> Trump supporters here in the city. Um, oh, I'm so tired of people saying that because we support Trump that we're racist when we're not. That. I I mean you know how out of touch you have to be to really believe that when everything out of the mouth of this individual is racist is meant to dehumanize, is meant to separate and tear people apart, is made people to feel like infestation, whatever word and terminology is being used these days to talk about uh, Latinos or people of color in general. Like, how can you tell me that any aspect of what he represents, if you still support him, um, means that you're not supporting racism? I mean, that's the bottom line. And so, so the idea of not allowing ourselves to be put on the defensive or to backtrack is like to really just hold our ground and be able to say this is the reality and you and trying to make me feel guilty are not living in the re you know in the real world so i mean those are the the, the challenges that we have but uh, it's it's yeah it's interesting. yeah i think that i think um you know specifically as a journalist one of the biggest challenges for me um has been in the past and i've seen this with other journalists is just the simple idea of being able to speak your truth or call something racist when it is. Um, for example, the ESPN reporter who called Donald Trump a white supremacist and then was suspended. Um, like I've in my past not at Jezebel, um, which is why I'm very proud to work there. Um, but in the past, I've had editors being like, well, you know, we have to be careful with that word. 
and they're white editors who are telling me this. And there's a white, you know, all white staff, and I'm maybe one of the only people of color on the staff. So it's, um, you know, and as somebody who's helping control the flow of the news and the stories that people are getting, me using the word racist has a very specific meaning, I think, and it's important and it holds power um, that if I'm not able to do that, then other journalists aren't able to do that, then that frames how people are seeing the story. Um, and especially a lot of people who do, maybe aren't recognizing that this is racism, you know, aren't seeing it that way. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the things, I, as an organizer, one of the things that I think is sort of the most interesting about this moment is that there are a lot of people who've never organized when there's not somebody to appeal to. So even when like the person's not on your side or doesn't sort of like you, you know that like enough pressure will get you in the room and you can sort of fight and you can push and you might disagree, but like there's something to appeal to. And this is a moment where like you don't really want to be in the room, right? Like be, being at the table at this table is not really a win because you never know if you're going to be on the menu or like a participant in the meal, right? Like you don't, you just don't know. And this is sort of a weird moment where you like can't ignore the federal government because the consequences are too great but you aren't necessarily asking to be a part of that process. And there are a lot of people who just like, this is like a different time to organize. So for the first time, for a lot of people, we're like fighting wholly from the outside, hoping that the pressure from the outside just changes the inside. Whereas normally you like fight from the outside because you're gonna like come in and try and help da 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 da, or like you're gonna maybe get a seat at the table or you're gonna propose a policy, but like, who on the, like, no, this administration is not listening to any, mm -hmm. anybody visiting the border. They're not like, send me your best policy proposal. That's like not <laughs> an option in this moment, which makes like the, which makes even the like, we should be outside every day so different because normally people have the payoff of like, there's a meeting or there's a whatever, or there's a, but that like doesn't exist in this moment. And I've seen people really struggle who like, we're trained as like traditional organizers where like you map power and you figure out who has it and then you press and you da 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 and you go to a meeting and, and like this administration is just not interested in that style. And I do think that's Excuse like, a, <laughs> bless you. I do think that's just like, that makes this moment different in a way that I think people are like still adjusting to. So how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you, like what are the strategies? What, what is the response and? I, I mean, I really there? do hope. <laughs> I mean, we talk about this all the time, and it, it sounds like really cliche at this point, but the issue of voting is so critical. You know, and, and, to, me, and to think about, I mean, there are, the percentage of people that are registered to vote that actually do vote, I mean, the number of people that vote in this country is pathetic. I mean, we all know that. Um, and so the idea, I'm hoping people have understand the sense of urgency that the only real, and we have our issues, right? There are people that want, that believe the two-party system sucks, that we gotta do something different, all that stuff. Reality is reality, we have the system we have, and I do hope people understand that the only real path we have is to really change the dynamics in the Congress, and that people are mobilized and engaged, and that's our job, you know, as part of Latino Victory. We're in the, pro you know, we support Latino candidates who are running for Congress at this moment. We, do, we support down ballot races too, but we really focus obviously on the midterm elections and endorsing candidates that are running in swing states and swing districts in particular, um, and really getting people engaged and energized and motivated to vote. And you know, I was explaining to Susan earlier that, I mean, with the numbers of, of Puerto Ricans that have come stateside because of, of the hurricane, you know, Florida has become an incredibly you know important district uh, state, obviously, but. The politics are not easy, right? In Puerto Rico, I was explaining to her, about 80% of people vote that are eligible to vote, 80 to 85% turnout. Um, you only have one election every four years. There's no primaries, there's nothing. You vote once every four years for every single position. So the concept of primaries, of parties, is not known. So we have to do a level of engagement with those voters from Puerto Rico in Florida because I have cousins that have moved and they're like, oh, I signed up as independent, right? And it's like, no, you gotta, you know, you gotta register with a party in order to vote for a primary. So there's a whole level of education that has to happen with that population to really understand that their vote matters and that they can play a role in making a, a difference. Um, if you're very appalled by how Trump has treated Puerto Rico, which they are, then you wanna make a change, then this is the way you make a change. 
that level of engagement of voter education at the grassroots is so critically important. But that, to me, is really where the focus is right now, because I don't feel we have an option. The courts sometimes come out with some decisions that are favorable to us, but sometimes they don't. Republicans are completely complicit in this, and somebody was making a mention the other day, it was like, Trump has a 40% approval rating, if you believe those polls, whereas the Congress has maybe a 10% approval rating. So those Republican Congress people are gonna wanna like, you know, be a butt's Trump in order to like, Trump's butt in order to be, in order to get reelected. So the idea of changing the Congress is critical and you know, we have to figure out how to make that. That to me is ultimately the priority in this next election cycle and that's really where a lot of our focus has to be. And New Yorkers, go out to other states if you can or figure out other ways that you can help but we need to be involved but yeah i do think too some of it is about believing people when they talk and there are a lot of people who just didn't believe donald trump he said all this stuff during the campaign and people were like oh ha, 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 not real and like it's real so that is one i do think there's also this question about as an activist i am like I, I'm writing. I just finished writing a book that comes out in September, and what has been in, what was interesting about the process is that I was looking at the number of people who write about sort of the protests and da, da, and they are all sort of like academics. They're people who like write for a living. It's not a whole lot of people who like Got did it. it. Right. And I think about during the election, like the loudest voices were people who like no matter what Trump did had nothing to lose. Right. So there are people who we love who I won't name who wrote incredibly important texts who like attacked Hillary at every step of the way, didn't write one piece about Donald, didn't write one piece about any Republican, but it was like, you can't vote for her. There were people who said that we can afford to lose an election, we can't afford to lose our values. There were professors at elite universities who said, don't vote in, in uh, states where it doesn't matter because like, then the party will finally realize that your vote can't. Like, these crazy things that only work if you're not gonna be impacted by the, like, if, if your strategy doesn't work, you're not gonna be impacted anyway, right? And I think there's like a weird silence where we like won't call that out. And I think that you see in this moment that those people were not the people, like they were not who you wanted to be on the team with because they got us, they like helped sort of shepherd us into where we are today. And, I, <laughs> and we're just like not honest about that. And you see those people now being, they're like chartering the, the jets to the border. They're like, we're gonna take 10 people. You're like, we needed you to show up and just be honest this before, right, you know what I mean? Like. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, and I think that we're just like not honest about that. And I worry, I really do worry about what that bodes for like the future. And the third is like, you know, I'm obsessed with like the structural issues. So people don't realize like ICE, for instance, in the 2009 House Appropriations Bill, there's a clause that said ICE has to detain a minimum of 34,000 people a day. It's the only law enforcement agency at the local, state, or federal level that has a minimum quota. It is a real quota. The Obama administration tried to argue that it was a bed quota, not a people quota. The court said, no, it's a people quota. So like, some of the problem with ICE is that there, there really is a structural. So when the guy who ran, ran ICE just quit and he was like, no, the laws are racist, I'm not racist. It's like he wasn't wholly wrong. The laws are racist and he was racist. But he was right that like the law actually does require ICE to detain 34,000 people a day. And what Trump did that was nefarious is that he just sort of came in and said he was going to double the quota. This was early. Now he's like, you know, done a lot more to the quota. But like that is true, right? And like how do we make sure that we ground this in like, this isn't always just bad people doing bad things. It is bad people changing the structure so the bad thing outlives the bad mm -hmm. person. And like we lose that when we personalize so much of it in the moment. And I worry about what that bodes for like our long term organizing. And that's, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, the issue of structural, like structural racism that permeates our institutions, you know, and how do you uproot that? And, and that was a challenge that as, as a legislator, as someone that was leading the city council, that really kind of was very present in my mind that everything that we did, I wanted to look through the lens of, of that and you know listen we're we're those of us that are in government there are, we always need the outside forces to agitate and to hold us accountable um but there was also sometimes the frustration that i think there was an um uh unfair right uh expectation of those of us right with those of us that are in office you know if we want to work and be effective, we cannot become irrelevant to the constituencies that we represent. And sometimes we have to work within a structure that we may not be comfortable in, but the reality is there and you have to figure out how to navigate and be most effective. So in the issue of like, when we talked about structural racism, 
and dealing with some of the summons issues in New York City, right? Understanding that people of color, particularly young men, African American, Latinos, were being disproportionately impacted by smoking weed or by drinking on the stoop or, or hanging the out in a out. right, jumping or, or hanging out in a park after dark, which people were getting arrested and getting a record for. Um, it were completely crazy. You know, we we implemented a policy to instead of arresting somebody and putting them in jail and possibly a, a stint in Rikers, instead there was a summons. You get a fine, you walk away at the end of it, the, you know, the police officer gives you a fine, you pay it, you know, and that's it, and you move on, you don't get a criminal record. So, you know, that idea of trying to figure out how do we uproot the system, or at least trying to make the system more fair, a step at a time, is, is really important, and that's why elections do matter, because you can elect people um, that have that mindset that are gonna be really truthful and committed and authentic in wanting to make changes happen, um, and, and do it in a way that can be really substantive. And, and so that's why you know it's not pie in the sky with such low voter turnout and engagement in this country, there's such potential Right, and being able to energize a base to really enact change um, because the threshold's so low at the moment. And that's unfortunate, but that's the truth. So, so um, that's why you know, I, I appreciate Common Cause and always ca calling for voter reforms and voter engagement and figure out ways that we can be more effective in that process. Um, and New York State ranks as one of the lowest and worst in terms of voter laws. Uh, so that has to change, but, uh, but yeah. All right, well on that note, I think, uh, I think we're ready to open it up for questions. We have a couple of minutes, if anyone. How do we wanna do this? Should I just pick on people randomly or is there a mic that's gonna be going around? They can go around. Okay, let's see. All right, uh, down here in the red, Thank you all for this tonight. It's really valuable and helpful and motivating and um, reminding. But as I continue to look at speaking our truth in the age of Trump, and I'm hearing racist, 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 I'm not hearing sexist at all. And I think with regard to engagement, if we add that to the dialogue, we add a lot more individuals who might feel personally threatened and willing to become an actor. Well, I mean, without a doubt, I mean, as a woman, right, uh, you know, he's a misogynist and, uh, and, you know, not just sexist. I mean, look at the policies they're enacting, which want to strip us of the ability to make decisions for ourselves um, and the language that is used. So, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, that clearly is is part of it as well. And that's that's, in, you know, in, that's to me part of the. When I talk about these issues, always the, the, the women's issue and the misogyny is clearly there front and center as well. I mean, that's very much a priority of this administration is to strip us as women of, of rights that we've gained over the years and the struggles that we've enacted the same way as you know, people of color. We're an imperfect nation. We always will be. Uh, but gains had been made. And I always say that it's so much easier to destroy than to build. And in a year and a half, the amount of damage that we've incurred as a nation um, is, is extremely, should be, it, the fact that it's not in any way um, moving these Republicans to act is beyond me. I mean, the, the idea that it's become that party of Trump is very scary indeed, but the misogyny is clearly aligned with that. Like it needs to become a big part of the dialogue in order to activate more individuals to participate as we talk about the truth. Yeah. Yeah, my only push would be that this is like an interesting example of like how do we see ourselves in connected struggle when it's not about us, right? And I think that there's like a, um, there are moments when I'm in places where people talk about the misogyny and like, I'm not a woman, but that's a real big issue, right? Mm -hmm. And I can, I can understand that like, if I don't acknowledge that as an issue, then like I'm missing something, that that's like on me, right? And if I'm not, if I'm not as committed to that issue as I'm committed to all the other issues, then like I need to figure out where I'm standing as like somebody who says they're committed to justice. So like, just because we don't name it doesn't mean that it's not a priority, but this is sort of the same argument that the All Lives Matter people had to us, right? That like, because we didn't say that the police were killing white people, which they were, and they continue to do, it wasn't that we wanted white people to get killed by the police, like, but we were focusing on one thing in this moment with the understanding that like, we want your commitment to justice 
also to like honor the fact that like we're focusing. So I agree with everything you said and like Lord knows he is like deeply misogynistic in a way that I thought was gonna sink the campaign when those tapes came out and it yeah, didn't, it which I think is like an indictment of this country in its own sort of way. And that white women still vote for him is like shocking. Like I just don't understand that. Like that's its own, like I need therapy for that issue alone. <laughs> But there is a, like, I do think we have to start talking about in public, like, how do we, uh, how do we live solidarity yes. on issues that, like, don't impact us directly? Right, and that's, the, yeah, exactly, and that's, that's the issue of, like, how do we unite all the struggles and understand that it, this affects all of us, right? And it's, that, that's um, the issue of, of solidarity. That's the word I use a lot. That's my generation, I guess. Everybody talks about intersectionality these days, and I guess that's the, 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 the term that people are, are using more now is that it all interrelates. And, and, uh, and those of us that truthfully in our heart believe, you know, as a Latina, as a woman, as someone that rep is, 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 you know, is coming from a colonized experience, like I want equality for myself, then I'm gonna want that equality for everybody else. And that's why I fight so hard for the undocumented immigrants. That's why I fight so hard for African Americans and in the criminal justice system being more equitable and fair and uprooting racism. You know, because I, something that I want for myself, we wanna, we gotta fight for it just as badly for, for everybody else. And we're all in it together and figuring out how do we make and connect all of those struggles because that not, we are not gonna survive this. And that's the reality of it all. So yes, yeah, seeing ourselves reflected in the struggles of others is critically important. And owning it, and not just saying, oh, it's owning it, right? It's, it's our struggle too, and we gotta see it as our struggle too. Um, in the front. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, I really appreciated the point of the conversation in which you talked about the idea of the left. Um, and as someone who, resents any of these and all of these titles that we use because I think that it just conflates in issues whether you're conservative or liberal or progressive there's so much conversation of progressive movement um, and when you're already so divided as a marginalized group and I'll say for a certain extent let's just say liberals are a marginalized group today right um, politically speaking how do you counteract that and as a New Yorker, as a native New Yorker, and, and we see what happens in, in gentrification in cities, there is a blue drain in this country, and more and more people are central to cities. And I've had this conversation with people about what that looks like, and we've not thought about geography and how removing people who believe themselves to be more progressive in the way that they want to live their lives and moving to cities is that we are oversaturated, and then the rest of this country is becoming more red in a way that naturally will exist once that, not brain drain, but people drain. Um, what's the conversation like with mm -hmm. progressives? I mean, I, I've always been skeptical of, of the idea and title of liberal because I feel like those have been the people who've been first to oppress and didn't have a problem with birthers. I mean, he, he'd been saying that before he'd said a lot of other things, and that wasn't a problem. Um, Central Park Five. Central Park, yeah. I mean, we the list goes on. So yes, with it's sexism, progression is there. everything is there. Is, is that we, especially as women of color, we have been at the forefront of most movements and have not been reciprocated. Um, you know, we've seen that with the shooting, that it wasn't, where were all those white female celebrities when kids have died, right? So like, it, it's really pretty, but, you know, and I think that's my, that's my hesitation with this idea of progressive movement right now and the divide of an already divisive mm. force. How does that look in the spaces that you guys are in? Where do, how do progressives and liberals kind of forge? Because a part I feel is we're not gonna get any better. And it really makes me nervous to see what's happening both geographically, so that one point being sort of this urban space versus everything else, and then uh, you know the, the progressive liberal fight or infighting, if we can call it that. You've been asking a lot of questions. Why don't you? We want to. I feel like you guys are better uh, equipped to answer that because I just work here in New York City, but you've been out in the country more and have worked with more people. So I feel like I'm just going to throw it back to you. <laughs> I think that so on the on the issue of the like. I hate to be the like capitalism because I think that people overdo the critique or like the way the critique is delivered. But one of the interesting things that people, when they talk about the free market, is this idea that sort of like the market's free and like the, no market, the market's not free, right? That like heavily regulated, always been heavily regulated, like a lot of rules everywhere, whether you see the logic or not, there's logic, right? And I think that one of the interesting things about the rural stuff is that we haven't figured out 
like we don't incentivize people sort of participating or staying or in you know what made me think about this is that there's a really interesting case study on dentists i don't know how much you care about the dentist but there are not a lot of dentists in rural communities a huge crisis so there are dentists that are going to rural communities but they only go and do like extractions right so not like actual dental care and there's a question like why right and it's it, one of the reasons is like there's no there's no financial like you just don't there's no gain there by like staying and I do think that there's an opportunity for the government to like d fix that at scale. That that's a choice that we could we could create a different incentive structure, like we've done for a host of other things. I think that's like real. I do think you're right that we don't talk about the like the um, community impact of people leaving. That like when you get all the people who like believe in gay rights just like leave a town of 50, then like that's sort of hard, right? And I don't think we do that well. And you know, I was talking to a celebrity who did a lot of campaigning for Obama and she was saying one of the most interesting and problematic things about her campaigning for Hillary was she was like, they sent me only to random places. She was like, Obama sent me to like West, nowhere knows anywhere and I'm knocking on doors and people are like, nobody's ever visited our town, da da da. She was like, Hillary he sent us to cities and she's like these people like were sort of interested but they like saw me on tv anyway so they were like sort of interested i went and i do think there's like this i think that it's easy to disregard the rural communities because we don't see it every day it's not on tv but like they vote and they're not always voting for things that actually benefit them so i think that's one the progressive thing i think that the reality that nobody wants to I think we sort of talk around it, is that like even the most liberal people don't really know what to do with race, right? It's like easy to talk about poverty, sexism sort of easy, easy to talk about for sure. Uh, the kids in cages is like sort of a, you just have to have no heart not to believe, like that doesn't even have to be about race to you, it can just sort of be about kids because you're a parent or like you know a kid. But the race thing, like <laughs> you like been around a kid before, but race like becomes this thing where people are like, I don't know. And you're like, what? Like, you don't, they like killed that little boy. And they're like, man, I don't know. They're like, I don't, and you're like, did you need to call me to make a statement about them killing like a 10 year old, the police killing a 10 year old kid? Like, you don't need the black guy to say that that's bad, right? Like that should just be bad. And I, I'm with you on the like, the race thing is still like a hard sort of space. I think the videos of police killings like opened up some space to people, but there is this interesting thing of like how many times I have to prove that I'm a human. It's like one of the reasons why we get upset about police training. It's like, I don't really know how many training modules you have to go to to not shoot a 12 year old black mm -hmm. kid. Like that sort of seems dramatic, right? That like you need a training not to do that. Or when we think about community policing, it's like, I don't know if you need to play football with like Timmy not to shoot him. That seems also dramatic, right? And when people talk about unconscious bias, it's like some of the bias seems pretty conscious to me, right? And like, why is everything automatically unconscious, right? Like the Starbucks incident seemed conscious to me. That was not like a, you're not like, oh, I didn't know they were black. You're like, no, you knew they were black. Like, that's weird. So the race stuff, I think, is still sticky. I think from a reporting perspective on that question, um, the big one of the big stories we would see before the Trump, like during the campaign, was like, oh, how does the rural American voter, the white guy who voted for Obama, like is now voting for Trump, and like that's so fascinating, and why is that happening? And then like two years later, checking in with that that guy, and he's so upset, like about how these policies are hurting him, and he's like so devastated. But like he's nowhere in that right, and then like nowhere in that conversation were we like visiting, were reporters going? Not obviously not all reporters, but like a lot of the a lot of outlets were more focused on like white people in the middle of nowhere as opposed to like the people of color who live there and what they've been experiencing and what they're thinking about and what they're worried about like even during the campaign and and then now also like we're starting to see it a little bit more like a lot more now but like it's also a little late to be starting to focus on that now um uh in the back um i got two quick questions one is if the Sarah Sanders thing is okay, then was the Supreme Court's decision in Masterpiece okay? And the second question is, um, what do you guys think about open primaries? The, the Supreme Court one is, which is, you're talking about the cake thing? Um, I mean, and that's one of the things that came up in that particular situation of the restaurant, right? That you had some of the workers there who are gay and who felt really offended that here was someone that would stand at the podium and talk about openly being okay with discriminating against them, 
right? If you talk about trans people in the military, or you talk about people getting married and being able to have access to floral arrangements or cakes, you know, without discrimination, and that, you know, so, you know, it's, it's I, no, I'm not in agreement with the Supreme Court decision, uh, but I think that people have a right in terms of, of, of they, they had a right to express it. She took, you know, the, the owner, my understanding was that she asked the workers, how do you feel about this? And she supported her workers when they said, well, we're not comfortable, you know, with her being here because of what she represents and that she represents denying me an opportunity, right? And she denies uh, us as a country of having a truthful conversation. Um, so it's, it's, I think, I mean, I support that decision. I don't support the Supreme Court decision. I think there's a different standard there, but I think you, you're jumping out of your seat. I think you want to respond to that in particular. Mm-hmm. I think with, Master, with the cake thing is you would be denied something because of who you are, because you're a gay person. In this case with the Mexican restaurant, it's not who, it's not that she's a whatever kind of person, it's what she did. It's she herself, Sarah Sanders, has been lying to us and doing all this exactly. heinous stuff and participating in this and people are objecting to her actions. So she's not being targeted as a member of a particular group. She's being she's being responded to because of what of the she acts did. she took right of what and she I think that's very different yeah and I think that like the other Volunteer. side of it is that there is a, there is a precedent in the law about public figures just being treated differently defamation law mm-hmm. libel right that like public figures actually there's like a different bar um, and I think that that is real I think that that is fair I don't know I think this idea of like what she did people would say that gay people had sex and that's sort of a bad that's like something they did too so I don't know I like hear you I don't know if I'm swayed by that as much but I do think this idea of like public figures the law actually just treats public figures differently like public like public figures don't get to like sue Fox News for every ridiculous comment they say about them but private people could totally do that stuff because like private people have a different like the law just treats them differently so I think that that is what's different about that but the second open primaries I'm gonna leave to you I am, to be honest, I'm not, I don't know how I feel about that. We were just talking about the issue of like um, special elections in New York and when special elections are called, they're, what is it? They're, that's what it is, open primary, right? Or nonpartisan, nonpartisan. So the the issue of nonpartisan, not not open primaries. Um, I don't know. I mean, and to some, to some extent, I think Bernie Sanders, when the primary happened, that conversation came up, right? People that were registered as independents that wanted to vote for Bernie felt that they had a right to be able to vote in the Democratic primary. And I felt like, absolutely not. Like, you know, those of us that have been, you know, that's a decision that's made moving forward, whatever. But, you know, those of us that have committed to a party and that have been loyal to a party and have helped build a party. Like I've spent a lot of time, you know, being a registered Democrat, whatever issues people may have with the parties, let me get let me make that clear. But I've helped go out and be surrogates for candidates. I've helped support Democratic primary candidates who are running in primaries. I've endorsed you know, you take time to build that house. So then to have someone who comes in after all that effort who hasn't contributed at all to help build that house. So then come in through the front door and say, well, I'm taking over, you know, I, despite the fact that I didn't nail in that, you know, that plank, I didn't do this, I didn't put that roof over that. Like the idea that you can just walk in and bear the, you know, or enjoy the fruits of the labor of, of others, I have, a, I have an issue with because I've given a lot of my time towards that. Um, if it's a conversation we want to engage in and if that's a direction we want to head in as a city, as a state, as a country, we can engage in that conversation, but you can't change the rules in midway, you know, just to basically appeal or, or, or to um, address a concern you have. So that's the issue, but that's a conversation moving forward that I would be willing to engage in if we wanted to just be open primaries. Um, I know a lot of, I think California has that. I think other places have that, but we don't, we haven't had that here. We'd have to engage in that debate, but I'm not sure how I feel right now about um, that. Back in that corner. And then there's someone way in the back. And how, yeah, how much time do we have left for questions? I want to see if everyone can. No, not everybody. Has Common Cause taken a position on that? No. On open primaries? Yeah. Okay. No. What we have taken a position on is the ludicrous deadline that we have yeah. in New York where you have to like two years change ahead or party registration the October of the year before the primary where nobody has any idea of what they're going to win. So for, if you want to vote in the Democratic primary in 2018, 
you had to have changed your party registration by Friday, October 13th, I know, because we did a whole campaign around it, of 2017, which is crazy. And we can't get the legislature to agree. They all say they want to change it, but they can't agree between 30, 60, or 90 days. So they're all going like this, and we have an unchanged primary deadline that makes no sense to anybody. And then the same people get up and cry crocodile tears about how nobody votes in the primary. Well, they make it unusually hard. No, I mean, and to me, it's, it's intentional. Yeah. Right, because the less people that are engaged and vote, the more that benefits the incumbent. Right. So the idea that we can have three to four elections in a given year is outrageous. It's a waste of our taxpayer dollars. And it is a way, to me, of voter suppression. You know, And I think it's, it's a way of trying to get a result by trying to engage the least amount of people possible. And that's just not acceptable. The idea of like same-day voter registration, early voting, those things are things we should definitely be engaging in in this, in this state. And that serious conversation has not happened at the state level. And that lies on the feet of the governor and lies on the feet of the state legislature. And we have gotten nowhere. What are we, like 48 out of 50? 47 out of 50 in terms of it's hard. It's horrible. It's embarrassing. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this very insightful uh, discussion and conversation. My question is a bit, I think, broader than kind of the U.S. and even local politics. Um, I think Trump is maybe one of the first times I want to believe in American exceptionalism really badly. Um, because I remember after Trump getting elected, kind of paying attention, seeing you know other elections going on, and you kind of see, especially in Europe, right? Like you had someone that was dubbed the Donald Trump of the Netherlands come very close to winning. We celebrated when Macron became you know the head of government in France, but like forget that like the National Front Party came very close to winning. Um, you see the rise of a five-star movement in Italy. Like you kind of see this across Europe in the midst of one of the largest refugee crises since World War II. Um, and I guess my question is, you know, on my best days, I think, we're going to get through this resistance. We're working together. Things will get better. And then on my worst, darkest days, I think, is this the trajectory that certain countries are heading in? Is America, are we going to get better? Or is this the new normal? Is Europe heading in the same direction? Is this? a knee-jerk reaction to a refugee crisis, a rise in xenophobic kind of rhetoric, behavior, kind of politicians using that as a wedge issue amidst, again, this like very large refugee crisis. Has this always been there? Um, and it's kind of just, I guess, an open-ended question on is today your best day or is today where you think this is the worst day? And are we going to get better or is this, again, the new normal and where we're headed, not just in the United States, but maybe I mean, saying globally, I know I focused on Europe, but there are many other countries I can also point to. Thanks. I think that I'm hopeful that a, a new generation of people in politics will just, I think that what Trump showed us is that you can, you can push way harder than people tell you you can push, like independent of the fact that he's like wild and all of it's bad. It's like he's doing things that people literally were like, it just can't be done, right? Like it was an impossibility and he's just like running roughshod through it and like, the government's still like, you know, people still getting paid. There's still like a, like people would have told Obama, like there's no way you could sign an executive order today like this, or, or like there's no way the tax code, and like he did it, right? And I, I do think there's something, there's something there that I think if, if used for good, you could see a generation of people taking that same energy and just like fundamentally transform people's lives in a way that I think could be really powerful. You know, what I'm hopeful about is that we can figure out how to build a bigger choir that people talk about like we don't need to talk to the choir and like I'm reminded that the choir needs to go to rehearsal and the choir needs to learn new music and, and learn how to sing the best song as possible like it's to the loudest group as possible and like I'm hopeful that we can like build a bigger choir that like I think there are a lot of people looking for a choir to join and just haven't found it yet uh, I think there are more of us uh, who want to sing then, then don't. I think that not everybody has a home and like I think that that is like a real sort of problem. And you think about the voter stuff, it's like what happens when voter disenfranchisement is at an all-time high, right? Not protected by the courts in the same way it was. This DOJ is certainly not protecting it. Mm -hmm. So like you see this wave happening of people who want to be in the work and just aren't able to. And I'm hopeful, uh, I'm hopeful that we can like do that. I think if there's anything that makes me nervous is that I think um, 
that there's like an industry now that is built on like reminding people that the world is pretty bad and not actually setting them up to do anything about it. There's like a whole sort of like set of people who like their timeline, their whatever is like, oh my God, bad thing happened, this bad thing happened, bad thing happened. So you leave being like, whoops, we're screwed. You don't leave being like, wow, that was really bad. We can do something about it. You get this flare up of like kids in cages. And then it's like, that's the one thing we can do something about. And the reality is all this stuff we could do something about. So I want to believe that this like, this tragedy affair moment is like a moment and then we'll pass. It'll go to like a solution moment. I want to believe that. I mean, we have to, and I think the, the issue, like you're saying, I think that we have to create the space and allow the opportunity for that next generation to thrive and not stifle them. Um, and so that, that is, is my concern. I mean, I, I look, I, I've been a fighter and I've been an organizer for my whole professional life and adult life. So I have always have hope, but I do feel very, very <laughs> depressed in the setting that we, we live in. Doesn't mean that I'm not gonna fight any less. I'm, I'm out there and I'm, I'm, I'm engaging and, and getting involved. But um, we, we can't, we shouldn't be too rosy about it to think that somehow we're gonna, you know, I think that we should be that sense of doom to hopefully motivate us into action. Hopefully, that's the way I would hope, that we have to have a sense of real, how dire this is and becoming with the complacency of, of, of a Congress that wants to do nothing, that we, it'll motivate us to do something. But I only, the, 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 where I see the hope is the young people. I don't know these movements, whether it's the Black Lives Matter or the, the Muslim ban and those that took to the airports and the Parkland kids and now the Dreamers. You know, um, it's, it's really that, that movement that is the one that gives me inspiration, but we have to allow them to fulfill it, right? Because there is, um, there is, there, there are those that just don't want to see that happen, or that still are talking down to the young people and, and feel that oh, they're still, you know, um, have a lot to learn. But there's, there's a lot of hope. I, I see it, and um, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to ride that wave with them, and I uh, hope everybody else continues to get engaged and move forward uh, in reclaiming our, our democracy and reclaiming. Uh, what we deserve as as people in this country, uh, that this country belongs to all of us and not just to a select few. And, and it's fascinating to me how Trump has been effective in trying to place himself in this everyday man kind of conversation <laughs> where you know people feel that they he represents them. Are you? you know, I mean, that's how delusional. I think that based that article that came out in the New York Times yesterday talking about that the more Trump is attacked, the more his base feels that they have to defend him and he could do no wrong in their eyes it's it's really it's an anomaly i mean it's just a, a time of contradictions to no end uh, i think we're gonna take maybe just two more questions i think that the last so, row okay. she's been i see her hand okay yeah. all the way in the back yeah yeah, yeah. all right hi thank you for having this panel i'm a registered independent and I am closely related to the millennial vote, which doesn't choose necessarily to fall in line with the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. Right here in New York, you have members of the Democratic Party who caucus with Republicans, yes. who vote with Republicans, yes. but yet have the name of Democrat with them, but yet do not hold the same liberty to maintain part of the Democratic Party. Don't you think it would behoove the Democrats not to distance themselves from independence when it can actually help you win an election instead of actually casting us aside when you see the Republican Party will take perverts, pedophiles, misogynists, racists of all caliber. But yet the Democratic Party would rather choose to not include independence when we could very well push the vote in favor of a Democratic win. No, and I think those are honest debates. And I'm not, you know, in, in my, in what I said, I was trying to explain my thinking. I'm not casting, and that's an honest debate that we need to engage in. But when you're in the middle of an election cycle, I don't think that that was the appropriate time to engage in that because things were moving forward. But I agree with you. I have a lot of issues with the Democratic Party, and I don't agree with a lot of the decisions. And when you're talking about the IDC and the independent Democratic conference are just bullshit. Um, 
Uh, you know, yes, I, there's major issues that I have with my own party, and nationally, right? The, the leadership of the party uh, has much to be desired. I believe they very much turned their back on the dreamers uh, when we were having those conversations uh, in the Congress. There's a lot of, of problems. So I agree with you that we have to engage in those conversations, and there's a lot of soul searching that we need to do. But that also brings up the conversation that we shouldn't be a two-party system anymore, right? I think that there has to be room for other conversations and for a more open process where you just don't have these two parties that dominate a system. There has to be room for others. That's why here in New York State, the Working Families Party was created and trying to create opportunities for other voices to be heard and to be validated. Um, and that's, that's part of, of a very vibrant and important part of our democratic process and values. I will say too that, you know, I was on the transition team for the, for the DNC. And one of the things that I left that experience sort of realizing is that the Republicans are just interested in power. It's sort of like they want to they want to get power. They're going to figure out what to do with it later, right? Like they that is sort of their strategy. The Democrats are like interestingly, it's like a weird exercise in values at the expense of everything else, right? So like you have like a this battle about some value based thing, whether it like the end result is power to actually implement the value or not, or like but it's like a value. It's just like a very different way to enter into the space. And I remember sitting in the room and like there was a slide that came up that said it was like three things that makes you a Democrat. And it was like supports our people, believes in our values, identifies as a Democrat. And we were like, I don't think that there were like, you know, I was trying to like offer a concession. I was like, what if people have two of the three? And they were like, no. And I was like, OK, try my part. But it was this weird thing about like, especially for the older members, like the value piece is actually way more important than the power piece. And like that, I think is just like a philosophical bent. And I left that like sort of the same level of whatever about the party but understanding like where some of the people who like dug their heels in especially with like the Bernie it was like it's the Republicans again are like power at all costs we're seeing that now yeah. and the Democrats are not they're like values at all costs and I think that the at all cost is sort of a problem in every scenario win or lose so I think that that's like a yeah I don't know I, I, I don't I don't think that like adopting the Republican strategy is like a winning Mm -mm. like long-term strategy, even if it's a winning short-term strategy. I don't think that the values at all costs, I mean, we know that's not a winning strategy because here we are. So like, I, I want to believe that there's like a middle space and I agree that like the, I think that the independent, the people who identify as independents, like the parties, notably the Democrats, don't necessarily make home in a way that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think they sort of take the moral high ground that like you need to see the light and then come over it. And I think that that is like patronizing. It doesn't mm -hmm. make a lot of sense politically. But I do think it's the question of like the at all costs, I think is like an interesting part of the equation. Well, just to mention on a progressive level, when I think about it, I attended the DCC event, the Democratic Con Convention. And that, at that convention, you had Como there and you had uh, Cynthia Nixon. People who chose to be on the side of Cynthia Nixon as opposed to Como were booed. That's not democracy. No, it's not. And that, therefore, I didn't find the convention to be democratic. And if you're going to boo someone who actually has the letter D behind their name just because they don't have the establishment vote, then you're actually saying to people who actually want to see the Democratic Party win that their vote doesn't matter. You're saying to them that basically, unless you choose an establishment candidate, your vote doesn't matter. He's a Democrat. He was there with me. His, he was booed just like I was because I wanted Cynthia as opposed to Como. So the Democrats really need to make a choice. Do you want to win? Or do you want to basically cast aside votes? I mean, I, I'll just I'll just say this, and I, you know, I'm taking a little bit more liberty since I'm not an elected official anymore. Um, you know, the the way that that Cuomo is is conducting himself as the leader of the Democratic Party of the state is to me deplorable. Um, and and I think yes, it's incredibly anti-democratic. And so I agree with you. That idea of trying to strong arm people, to bully people, to ostracize, whether it's a union or whether it's nonprofits, if they don't go the way you want them to go, I mean, that's to me is, is, is everything we're fighting against when it comes to the, at the national level. And we seem to have some lack of interest in really pushing back on that at the state level um, from some of our, of our leadership. 
But I, I don't, I don't, I'm not particularly fond of the way he's conducted himself and the way he's led this party. And I think that there needs to be more room for more voices, without a doubt. So we're at 30. Should we take one more question and then Maybe somebody who hasn't spoken. I don't know. I don't know who that would be. I think this, this person's been, and these two have been raising their hand oh, yeah. a long time. Yeah. Hi, thanks. I'll try to make this quick. Um, Professor Derek Bell, before he passed, a civil rights attorney, he had a theory called interest convergence. And he said essentially that uh, white Americans will work in the interest of supporting black interests or the interests of the oppressed, so long as working for those disempowered people will benefit the white community. However, at the point that working in the interests of the traditionally oppressed causes a detriment in the privilege that white communities have amassed, that convergence of interests will cease and that support and allyship will cease. As we are speaking our truth and as we are being very openly expressive about confronting structural white supremacy in ways that we have never been before in my lifetime, how do you see the limitations of interracial collaboration and allyship playing out going forward as we recognize the 53% of white women who voted against their feminist interests in favor of whatever interests we notice that you know people are often engaged in voting for and protecting policies that would protect the white supremacist interests but will harm them in healthcare, will harm them in housing, will harm them in the access to resources. How do you see the limitations of interracial collaboration playing out as we move forward? <laughs> Um, I, and a quick answer. I, yeah, not really a quick answer to that. <laughs> um, I, I can say that, that I sort of I already see that happening. I, I don't think that that ever, has ever stopped. I don't think it's going to stop, and I think that we're going to continue having to deal with that. But I see that happening. Um, really, even in like we were just talking about the Democratic Party, but like for example, in just who the um, Democratic Party is is supporting in some of its elections around the country, you can see that there are a lot of really, really progressive, I mean, I think there was an article in the New York Times a few weeks ago maybe about um, a lot of black women who have been running, um, but they don't have the support of the party, and instead the party has been supporting these, um, you know, older white men who have established roots, and I think that's a perfect example of what you were talking about. So I don't think that that's a future problem we have to deal with. I think that that's a current problem, and it's still there, and um, that's part of the work that, unfortunately, we're having to do, and I, I don't really see that stopping. I do think that, like, in, in a very simple way, I think that white people have to start organizing white people in, in like, earnest and, like, long-term work. And I think that right now a lot of people of color are organizing white people or, like, white people are joining things led by people of color, which is really important. But they're, like, I don't, I know white guilt theoretically. I don't know what that feels like, right? Like, I, that's not, like, never had that. So I think that, like, white people will have to figure out how to be the translators about, like, the long-term win. And I think that that can't continue to be, like, the sole burden of people of color or, like, I'm, traditionally oppressed people, I think if we figure that out, I think that the rest will work itself out. All right. All right. Well, okay, I want to say thank, thank you. you. Everybody. Thanks to our panelists for a really a fascinating discussion. Um, and I would like to say that my takeaway from tonight is we've got to be tenacious. Uh, that's our message. We dig in. We, we work for change. Join us at Common Cause to get that done. And if you're interested in helping register people to vote at Saturday's rally in March, uh, you'll find people with clipboards on the way out. Thanks.